All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. Appreciate everyone being here for the uh, first of two special lectures on Ebola. Uh, for those of you that are watching recorded, uh, this is November, 11, uh, November 17th, so I may say some statistics that will be out of date by the time you see the recording. Um, as most of us know, Ebola was in the news a lot and then has tended to drift out of the news, but it remains a really important international public health challenge. The CDC reports today over 14,000 cases in West Africa, over 5,000 deaths. Uh, there have been 10 people with Ebola hemorrhagic fever treated in the United States, and as of this morning, the second death has occurred in the U.S. of a doctor who was treating patients in West Africa and just came back to the States. So it remains an important problem. It's an evolving issue, uh, and I'm very pleased that we have Ed Kelly with us today to speak about the quarantine law and the Ebola crisis. Ed is the chief counsel for ETSU, uh, also an adjunct faculty at the Appalachian School of Law where he teaches disability law, employment law, and alternative dispute resolution. He also is a regular lecturer in the College of Public Health speaking on quarantine law, so certainly a topic of, of great interest. Ed is a senior Fulbright uh, scholar, having served in Ukraine, uh, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan, and then upcoming in the spring will be going to Lithuania. Uh, Ed got his law degree at SUNY Buffalo, uh, as his undergraduate and was a former assistant state attorney general for New York. We're very fortunate to have Ed Kelly speak to us today about quarantine law and the Ebola crisis. Ed, welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. The, um, a few years ago, I was asked to give a lecture on any topic of my choice at the, at the, at the public health law school, and, um, or the public health school, and, and I chose quarantine because where I work with the disabled and the rights of the disabled, we have a very funny attitude about quarantine and segregation that goes way back. And, uh, and a perception of quarantine or a perception of isolation that kind of goes against disability law. And once this came up, the Ebola crisis, quarantine came back into the news and it was a major concern for us. And, um, and what I'm gonna say today is we're on the cusp of dealing with a 21st century disease with a 14th century toolbox. You're going to see that the quarantine um, has been around for quite some time. And what we're looking at, and we saw a lot of panic when, um, when Ebola first came to the United States. How many of us read The Hot Zone? Which was published in 1994, telling us all about Ebola, all about pretty much about what was going on with it, but we didn't do much about that, did we? And we had two or three outbreaks of Ebola before it came here. I guess we assumed that somehow it was not going to come here because it's so hard to get to the United States in this day and age with transportation. But much to our shock that it, it did come, and we have a concern about that. Let's start with Albert Camus, the existentialist writer. Not a health person, but he wrote uh, a, a novel uh, a French novel called The Plague. And this is a quote from his novel. N Everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world. Yet somehow, we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from a blue sky. There have been as many plagues as wars in history. Yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. We think of the enemies and the horror that war is, don't we? We think it's just a terrible thing, war. Um, we had a flu epidemic in 1918. We also had World War I in 1918. And my grandfather, Thomas Kelly, he died on Christmas Eve 1918 of the flu during that flu epidemic, as did a great number of people. And World War I claimed an estimated 16 million lives. The influenza epidemic that swept the world in 1918 killed an estimated 50 million people. One-fifth of the world's population was attacked by this deadly virus. Within months, it had killed more people than any other illness in recorded history. This was an airborne influenza, pretty much like the influenzas we, we get vaccinated against, we, get, we deal with now, and we have other influenzas that come upon us and, 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 and get to us. But 
while we might put all our effort in defense from a war, do we put the same effort into public health? This is the Ebola virus. We've all seen this in the paper. We know where, where it is. It's the, that 21st century, uh, 21st century disease that we're going to be dealing with in part with quarantine. Public health law. What's the purpose of public health law? Well, public health law is defined as a study of the legal powers and duties of the state. And I think we saw a lot of that in the last couple of weeks is some confusion about the legal powers and duties of the state to assure conditions for people to be healthy, to identify, prevent, and ameliorate risks to health in the population, and the limitations on the power of the state to constrain the autonomy, privacy, liberty, or other legally protected interests of individuals for protection or promotion of community health. And what are the themes of government health law? And as I'm reading these, think a little bit about what we saw in the last few weeks. Is what was the government's power and duty? Who could do what? Who was making decisions? Were governors making decisions? Were school boards making decisions? Was the president making decisions? Was Congress making decisions? Were police departments making decisions? Coercion and the limits of state power. There's a line in, in one of my favorite lines in Shakespeare is in Henry IV where Glendower says to the king, he says, I can call the spirits from the vasty deep. And the king turns to him and says, so can I, so can any man. But when you call them, will they come? And that's one of the questions as Americans, given our sense of autonomy, that we have to ask ourselves is, when we call them, will they come? <laughs> Government's partners in the public health system. Who are the partners? Pharma pharmaceutical companies? Who are the partners? NGOs? Who are the partners? Doctors Without Borders and others who are working on this? What's the population focus? How did, how did this thing get discovered that people are writing a book about it in 1994, which was a bestseller then, and apparently from this week's New York Times is, is, is on the bestseller list right now. Um, where, where were the populations? Was nothing done because of the population that, that was involved? Communities and civic participation, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about the 2003 SARS epidemic. The theory of prevention, orientation, and also, and we'll talk a little bit about American use of quarantine, the concept of social justice. Who do I use quarantine and how do I use quarantine? And the problems in public health law, apathy, power, social stigma, if I'm quarantined, is there a social stigma? Legitimacy and trust. Now you can read those things and they're just words, but think about what's happened in the last few weeks. Did we see evidence of apathy? Did we see, this, did we see where we didn't trust uh, institutions? Did we see where there was a social stigma when somebody came back from West Africa? Did we see people perhaps abuse power? So the topics of the day are this. History of quarantine and isolation the role of public health law, our experience with pandemics, quarantine and isolation, and some of the lessons learned or things we have to look to in the future. Who invented quarantine? We've got lots of very brilliant public health students here. Who is the inventor of quarantine? Who invented it? Anybody? Romans. Who? Romans. The Romans, that's a good, that's a good guess. Could be the Romans, could be someone else, but you know who it was really? Here we are, it's the old guy. Okay, this is Michelangelo's creation. And the old guy is God. Okay, quarantine shows up in the Old Testament, Leviticus. It's the Lord speaking, which is kind of like speaking back in those days. He spake with Aaron and he says, when a man shall have the skin of his flesh, a rising scab or a bright spot, and it be in the, the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy. And then he goes down and he says that we'll put that person away for seven days. So we see even in Numbers and Leviticus, we see evidence of quarantine. So 
for me to say, but you are right that the, um, that the actual use of quarantine for the shipping and mercantile in, uh, uh, area showed up in Venice and also in Dubrovnik, Croatia. There's a dispute over which one used it first. So the practice of quarantine as we know it began during the 14th century in an effort to protect coastal cities from plague epidemics. Ships arriving in Venice from infected ports were required to sit at anchor for 40 days before landing. The practice called quarantine was derived from the Italian words quaranta giorni, which means 40 days. So we had quarantines of 40 days and that's where the word quarantine comes from. So it's kind of like the Romans invented it because when the Lord was speaking, he didn't speak about quarantine, he spake about putting them away. I was just thinking of the movie Ben-Hur when, when the Judah Ben-Hur's mother and sister had are been put away for leprosy. Out of the cells and the Romans torched those cells. Mm -hmm. That's right. Fire. Yeah. That was their approach to leprosy, which when you think about it, wasn't all that bad. It wasn't all that bad. And when the Lord was speaking to Aaron, he was talking about leprosy. Yes. And when I was a little boy, we, we used to, I went to a Catholic school, so we always had these, these saints we had to talk about. We had St. Damien, who uh, was at Molokai, uh, uh, an island off the coast of Hawaii, where people with leprosy were quarantined. So leprosy was a big one for quarantine, even though quarantine wasn't really that effective for that particular affliction. of the chariot race said, look for your mother and sister in the valley of the lepers. Mm -hmm. That is, if you can recognize them. Mm -hmm. Right. Masala was a guy. Yeah, that's, I remember. I How many of us are old enough to remember the movie Ben-Hur? Charlton Heston. <laughs> very few. We're, there's very few of us, yeah. This uh, yellow jack is the, uh, when I'm a ship that has been quarantined and I want to warn people to stay away, this is the semaphore for Lima, L for L. Uh, and if you see this on a ship, you don't want to go aboard it because it's being quarantined for some sort of a, uh, a situation. We move forward from Venice. Now, but think about this. When we have the quarantine taking place in these early days, what do we have? We have shipping. We have people moving around is one of the big concerns, right? That, that we first get into it is going to Venice, going to Rome, going to, and later on, many European countries with the Black Plague, with other, other uh, diseases and other epidemics, um, imposing these quarantines through, throughout Europe. We come to the United States and the first person on the federal level to impose a quarantine is George Washington, but quarantines were, quarantines were in existence before that because they were local. Much like Venice or Dubrovnik, Boston, New York, Charleston, all of the port cities imposed quarantines, depending on yellow fever coming or something coming to the, to the area. So it was a local problem. Uh, in 1799, we had the uh, various variations of the plague and smallpox still pose deadly threats. And George Washington signed the first quarantine act, first federal quarantine act in 1799. That doesn't mean there weren't quarantines, but those quarantines were generally in port cities. Ships were quarantined off, off the area. So we've had quarantines in the United States for quite some time. John Adams later tried to pass a more effective quarantine law, and John, the second president of the United States, tried to pass a more effective quarantine law. He was resisted by Congress. He invented something called grid that we may have, that we may have pretty much today even. And that gridlock kept him from passing a, an effective quarantine law. On the other side of the street, as sometimes happens in a government of three branches, we have John Marshall, the first justice of the United States Supreme Court, in a case called Gibbons versus Ogden, says and defines the Interstate Commerce Clause and says, well, there are certain things that are so obvious, we all know the federal government can regulate. And one of them is quarantine. He specifically points out quarantine is one of the things that could be regulated by the federal government. Now, there have been some recent cases by the United States Supreme Court that might call that into question, 
but one thinks very carefully before he disputes John Marshall in Gibbons versus Ogden. President Chester Arthur issued a proclamation that grants him and the federal government the power to quarantine persons entering the United States through its ports of entry to avoid the spread of pestilence. Although the proclamation used the word pestilence several times, it did not mention the specific name of the dreaded disease from which Arthur was trying to protect the nation, tuberculosis. If you want to see the present power and the present uh, federal and state quarantine authorities, there's a really fine Congressional Research uh, Service report, which, is, which is, I've, I've given you the site up there, that you might want to take a look at, and that'll give you the authority in more detail than what I'm going to do today. That authority is one of silos. We've got local maritime silos at the ports of entry, which are very much into screening people as they come in from ports of entry, much like it would have been in Venice or Dubrovnik in the 14th century. We have states that come in and impose authority. We know that because we know Governor Cuomo and Governor Christie took a stand uh, with the nurse, Ms. Hickox, who was coming back from West Africa and imposed a quarantine. And we all saw her in kind of a great big baggie for a day and a half before she was allowed to go home to Maine. And then some dispute going back and forth about what she could and couldn't do in Maine at the time of the 21-day uh, at-home quarantine that she was under. And we'll talk a little bit about how that uh, was used in the SARS epidemic of 2003 in Canada. The federal authority at begin, in the beginning, uh, and for a, a long time, was to assist the state and local government in imposing quarantines. And the constitutionality, at least until recently, was a given. Marshall, Marsh, John Marshall in Gibbons versus Ogden. Quarantine in the United States. In typhoid, we've heard the, the phrase typhoid Mary. Well, that's typhoid Mary Mellon. And typhoid Mary Mellon uh, had typhus, but she was, a, she was a carrier. She wasn't afflicted with it herself. Or she was afflicted with it, but she wasn't contagious herself. Or, I'm sorry, she was contagious, although she wasn't, uh, wasn't afflicted with it herself. And she was told to avoid working in restaurants because what she would do is work in restaurants that would spread the typhus and she would get into considerable trouble and then she'd be let go, but sure, she had to live so she would go work in a restaurant again and eventually she was quarantined for nearly 20 years uh, and kept away from people for nearly 20 years because of um, her spreading the disease. President McKinley at the beginning of the 20th century, imposed, or 1900, quarantined uh, the Chinese persons in San Francisco. And what we have there is what we call a cordon sanitaire. It was not just a quarantine where I take you and I put you somewhere. It was a quarantine where I put guards around a neighborhood and nobody goes in and nobody goes out. Cordon sanitaire. And they did this in San Francisco, and it had a devastating effect on Chinatown. It never recovered because the people couldn't go, go to work, come to work. People couldn't uh, operate their businesses if it was within that area. And it had, a, it had a very definite effect on this group of people. There was quarantine of immigrants in New York. If, if a ship came in, we would quarantine the individuals if they appeared at all ill and put them, and, and there were places where we could put them for a period of time, whether it be 21 days or 40 days or seven days or, or whatever. But we noticed historically that it was selectively enforced. If you were in steerage, you had a good chance of being quarantined. If you were coming in first class, you weren't going to be quarantined. Uh, and and that, that kind of behavior is a major concern in American quarantine and American quarantine law and people with disabilities are very skeptical of quarantine for that reason is, is we're separating people the lepr leprosy issue and other issues we're separating people who don't need to be separated. This is from the uh, Journal of American Medicine finding that 
Isolation strategies have often dealt differently with persons of different social and economic status, and the burdens of infection control policies have fallen more heavily on those least able to bear them, the poor, immigrants, and marginalized ethnic groups. In World War I, for instance, we had a quarantine imposed on prostitutes to, provoke, to prevent the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, and prostitutes were rounded up. And these kinds of roundups uh, lend themselves to abuse. And this, this, that one perhaps as an abuse is a concern. So the quarantine carries with it the stigma. Remember we talked about the problems with public health, one of them being stigma, is that a quarantine can carry a stigma. If I come back from West Africa and I put in quarantine, I might be perceived as a person who is, as the Lord spake, unclean. Problem one with a quarantine or a situation where something comes along. Ebola, we're lucky, actually, because Ebola comes along and it isn't transmitted through the air. It isn't transmitted like a flu. Uh, it kind of lends itself to quarantine because we, we want to avoid people having contact with each other. Uh, the flu epidemic or the SARS epidemic in 2003 um, are different because it spreads very quickly and you don't have a lot of time to second guess. As a matter of fact, sometimes you don't even have time to guess. It's there. And who's in charge? International. Are, is there, are there international authorities in charge? Was someone in charge in 1994 when we were reading the hot zone? Was somebody in charge during various outbreaks between 1994 and the present time, and the last, uh, last one? Were the international responsibilities, including us, responsible in dealing with the situation uh, at that time. National, who's in charge? We, see, we saw that in the last few weeks. Who was in charge? We had governors making decisions. We had all sorts of people making decisions. Here's a, a recent, just, just posted, Americans with Disabilities Act lawsuit. This is a, the Milford Health Director, Dennis McBride, told the family, although the risk of infection with Kialua, who has, had been to Africa, but not to West Africa, might be minor, the primary reason for his decision that she be quarantined at home for 21 days was due to rumors, panic, and climate at Meadowside. This was a decision by the town's public health. This was a decision by the town's public health official, he said in a statement. The state did not play a role in making this determination. The family is not under any quarantine orders. So we have, we have a health director, we have a, uh, we have a governor, we have a public health official. We have all sorts of entities who seem to be in charge. Problem two, science or fear. We talked about the reason for quarantine being fear, the reason for quarantine being panic. Well, which directors, which directors are politicians listening to when they make their Ebola quarantine decisions? Is it the CDC or is it uh, the fellow who does that Walking Dead? And another problem we have, and I talked about this a few years ago, that, that it seemed our system, as opposed to even the Canadian system, uh, lends itself to very serious problems in implementation or design of a remedy or a cure because of silos. And by silos, I mean this. We have a public health institution or structure and the federal government, we have one in the state government, we have one in the local government. In the state governments, not Tennessee by the way, but in the state governments, some of their quarantine laws are over 100 years old. And the Tennessee law is not the same as the New York law, which may not be the same as the Ohio law. So we have issues. Health professionals may be licensed in one state but not licensed in another, not available to come to one state or another. So we have some issues there. Local is where we're, where, we're, where we're going to see the problem, is where the person comes in with the illness, the person walks into the hospital, and we have, to, we have to deal with it. And all of these public health institutions, three different ones not necessarily operating on the same, uh, on the same game plan, law enforcement, if we're talking quarantine, we have to enforce it, uh, law enforcement, uh, all sorts of separate entities within the state of Tennessee. There's the state law, the TBI, there's the um, 
There's the local law, the city of Johnson City. There's the county law, the Washington County Sheriff's Department. There's the Public Safety Bureau here at ETSU. This is, this is here right now at this moment. There are all these different entities that might or might not coordinate, that don't coordinate all that well in normal situations. How are they going to coordinate in the case of a pandemic? Looks like they won't. We'll find, I mean, it's one way to find out. The uh, emergency management. Uh, do we have emergency management and are they coordinating? Medical care service. And my, my field, the courts. How are the courts going to resolve this? Because if you take me and put me in quarantine, I have a right to, I have trouble with this, I have a right to um, have my due process. I have a right not to be taken to prison. In fact, one of the most sacred rights of, Ameri of an American citizen is the right of habeas corpus, where I go into the court and I say, you have to tell me why you're holding me in custody. You have to justify this. And I would go to court. So who makes that decision? That the decision of our local uh, our, our local physician that a person has Ebola or maybe may have been, trans may have been uh, uh, of concern on Ebola, that the person should be quarantined, that can be immediately reviewed by who? A Sessions Court judge who handles routine criminal matters all the time. So somehow we're going to end up in court trying to see whether or not this person should be in court or not. And we did see that in the case of Ms. Hickox, didn't we? She was quarantined in New Jersey for a short period of time and then the governor allowed her to leave to go to Maine under certain restrictions. When she didn't follow those restrictions, the matter was taken before a Maine judge who made a ruling on the case. So we have a lot of people reviewing and making decisions in a very deliberate fashion uh, involving this and not very much coordination. The current situation. In general, individual states are responsible for intrastate, within the state, public health controls measuring using their laws, intrastate. Significant variation among state laws, now, and not just variation among state laws, is there some of, some of the state laws involving quarantine are over 100 years old. There is a model act uh, that, that some states consider, that some states have adopted that some states have to, um, to deal with emergency situations, but there's no uniformity. A significant, uh, some local jurisdictions may have public health control provisions that are easier to use than the state, but the state may come down and impose, impose their rules as well. And the state local public health officers have experience, have experience with individual controlled me measures such as tuberculosis, school immunizations, mental commitments. When we talk about legal authority for quarantine, the case everyone refers to is Jacobson. And in Jacobson, um, the uh, Massachusetts court held that the uh, that vaccination, that a person could be convicted of a crime for refusing to be vaccinated. And the court said the state has the right to require a person to be vaccinated. Okay. The current situation in federal law is the federal government has concurrent power to apprehend, detain, or con conditionally release individuals to prevent the interstate spread of international, import or international importation of certain diseases. Those are diseases identified by the president in an executive order. And Ebola happens to be one of them. It's, just, it's, it's been added, hemorrhagic fever is, um, is included in that executive order. Seems like a timely thing with everyone talking about executive orders today. Um, such federal, federally quarantinable diseases must first be listed in an executive order signed by the president. Now notice the court says if it's intrastate, it's the state. If it's interstate commerce, it's the federal government. Problem coming out of that. Interstate, intrastate. In this day and age, where did Miss Hickox go? New Jersey. And then where did she go? Maine. 
where did uh, Mr. Thompson, the first person to come across, go? He came into, uh, I think, did he come in Atlanta and then to Texas? So intrastate doesn't really have the clout it did in 1799, does it? In 1799, if I wanted to go from Atlanta to Texas, it was a chore. It was something that was going to take an awful lot of my time and effort. Now, interstate, hell, heck, inter, inter countries is, uh, is something that happens all the time. This isn't a ship coming into Venice that's been out to sea for months. This is an airplane on the same day that it left West Africa, bringing somebody in. It is possible for federal, state, and local laws to all come into play in a particular situation. The example, and this is from my, uh, my uh, PowerPoint from three years ago, an arriving aircraft at a large city airport. Hence, coordination is critical. The enforcement issue, each level of public health official must effectively connect with their respective law enforcement counterparts to assist as necessary in carrying out a mandatory public health order. Underline that, that if I'm a public health official in Washington County, do I have a relationship with the police agencies? Do I have a relationship with the courts? Have we had the chance to talk about what we would do in, in this particular kind of situation? And that was one of the lessons that really came out of the SARS epidemic in Toronto, was the need to be able to pull these things together. It's not the, it's not the kind of thing lawyers have where I'll get, you, I'll get you their answering papers in two weeks. Right, we've got, we've got a health emergency and we have to respond quickly. In 2003, we had SARS in Toronto. Now SARS is a flu-like epidemic, very contagious, much more so than Ebola. And uh, it, it started in China. China has control. China has a government that is in control. They applied cordon sanitaire to certain areas and said you can't come in, you can't come out of these areas. People were required to, um, to be quarantined and there were very significant sanctions that took place. So we're not China. We don't have that kind of control over people. And quite frankly, if, if you read the New York Times last week, Abraham Bergesi, who had worked here, pointed out one of the problems uh, with uh, imposing quarantine or Im imposing that in our country is we don't tend to do what the government tells us, right? We're, I mean, that's, we started out not getting along with the British and, 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 and from time to time we've had civil wars and everything else that, that we're not the kind of people who love um, to, be, to do what we're told. Um, but Canada was different. Canada is um, very much like us. And the Canadian experience gives us some hope. Over 13,000 people were quarantined in Toronto during this epidemic. Only 27 formal quarantine orders needed to be served, and there was only one formal appeal, which was later withdrawn after exposure was explained. What practical experience did we learn from Toronto? One, it demystified quarantine. People experienced social cohesion in a public health emergency. People took responsibility rather than divisiveness, cooperation rather than panic. When, the lesson is this, when presented with clear communication and guidance, public behavior can be very responsible in a public health emergency. If I just said that and I didn't have Toronto to show you, I could see you being very skeptical. But Toronto is a lesson to be learned. Levels of quarantine evolved there. The use of masks and gloves. They had something they called snow day. People didn't come to work. Shelter in place. People were asked to stay at home. They weren't taken off into quarantine. And, and uh, voluntary isolation was a major, uh, a major part of this quarantine. It was telephone monitoring in the home. Uh, in cases where people actually had SARS, there was isolation. A lot of times people use those two words interchangeably, quarantine and isolation. Isolation is isolation that we have for someone who actually has been infected with the disease and it's active. 
quarantine is those who may not actually have the disease but have been exposed to the disease. Quarantine, but you'll see people use those two terms um, interchangeably. Okay, they invented the concept of work quarantine. And look at our culture. Look at our culture. At least uh, people think that if, you, if you've got a cold or you, you've got the flu or something and you come to work, that's kind of heroic. Right? We think, we think you, you come to work no matter what. And perhaps we have to start rethinking that kind of, that kind of behavior. That individuals really should be careful not to come to work when they're sick and, and apply this work quarantine. Active use of law enforcement officers to serve process, to serve legal process, and monitor the situation. Because once I have to monitor, I'm, I may need more, I may, I may need the help of police officers. Public health must be prepared to act boldly and swiftly, and especially here, I think, is to treat individuals with dignity and fairness. And I think we've seen examples, watching television over the last few weeks, of situations that could have been handled in giving the people more dignity and more fairness. What are the practical steps that we learned from Toronto? One, know your legislation. And, I, and I'll tell you right now, uh, our legislation, federal, state, and local, leaves a lot to be desired, especially at the state levels. Uh, although states like Tennessee have good quarantine laws, they're not the same as the laws of other states. So, you know, there's really a need to take a long, hard look at the, at the state legislation, local legislation, and federal leg legislation. There's a need to plan due process. We can't spend a lot of time in courts when we're faced with a health epidemic. We need to draft the documents in advance. We need to contact other jurisdictions. Right here, if we should have an outbreak here, North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky, there's a lot of places that, uh, you know, diseases tend to go over state lines. They're not very, not very um, considerable, considerate of the state lines or state requirements. We could put the police there and arrest the diseases when they come, but that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, contact with other jurisdictions. Engage the courts in advance. Anticipate very practical problems. Communication, communication, communication. Okay, preparedness. Does your quarantine authority currently cover SARS or Ebola? Identify your decision makers. Who makes the decision? Who's, who's the decider, to quote a former president? Plan your due process. State procedures vary or may not directly address due process issues for quarantine and isolation orders. Courts may ultimately review the quarantine, the quarantine or isolation orders. Due process is a flexible concept. Due process meaning notice and a reasonable opportunity to be heard and showing that there is a reason, a substantial evidence to support a decision to quarantine. Common elements of due process, adequate notice, a written order. Did the person, was the person given a written order? There was a case in California of a Laotian refugee who had a very uh, contagious form of tuberculosis who was given a notice to, um, uh, to come in for treatment. And she didn't. And the police came and got her in handcuffs and brought her to uh, the jail and left her in the jail for three days with very contagious tuberculosis and she was brought before the court and it turned out the reason she didn't do what she was told was she didn't speak English. She spoke Laotian. And so there was, uh, there was an award to her but the situation and the actions that were taken probably served to spread the disease more than anything this poor Laotian woman would have done. So, so adequate notice, a written order, a right to be heard, to present evidence and witnesses to confront the evidence of the agency. And perhaps the person is entitled to, and the courts haven't decided this yet, is the person entitled to access to legal counsel? And is there a final decision that a court can review? Draft the documents in advance, a quarantine order. Do we know what one is supposed to look like? What are the supporting affidavits supposed to be? 
Uh, do we give the person an explanation of due process procedures? This is not the kind of thing you want to do when an individual is, uh, is being quarantined. Okay. Final thought is this. The ability to respond timely. In American culture, we are individualistic. We're legalistic. We're wary of government. We have a federal system, which is what we wanted in the beginning, right? In the beginning of the Constitution, we had a federal system. And the federal system is a wonderful system, but it doesn't work quite that well in quarantines. So it's time to look at the quarantine law and the quarantine system, uh, if we're going to use it, and, if, and, and the time to look at it is now before the pandemic comes about. So I've got time for maybe some comments or questions. Do we have time for comments or questions? Yeah. yeah. I've got a question. If, if the federal government were to issue a quarantine order on Ebola, for example, are the states then, is preemption prevent a state from doing a more restrictive or prevent, prevent them from being less restrictive? No, yeah. Well, what, what they've been very careful in quarantine law to indicate that the federal government is secondary. So there's some areas where preemption really doesn't apply. So the federal government is advising and doing the things that it does, but it doesn't preempt the state law because the state law is a primary by statute, not constitutionally for everything else. The federal government, not everything else, but most everything else, preemption applies. That's the right of the federal government to trump the state government when it comes to making legal decisions. And there are exceptions to that. And one of the exceptions is, is quarantine law, that the state has primary responsibility. Now, when it comes to interstate, uh, interstate commerce, and the big question now is, there have been a couple of very recent Supreme Court cases uh, that limit interstate commerce and the interstate commerce clause to where perhaps it, the court would not say the federal government doesn't really have any power. Is uh, interstate, if mm -hmm. someone travels from another country, haven't they are automatically committed interstate commerce? And ports of entry. And the federal government has primary authority at the ports of entry. So it's, it's and, and in given the ability to people to travel, it's almost irrelevant. And the problem there is, who does make the decision? And, you know, the, and the time to make that decision is now, not, not when, uh, when the wolf's at the door. Robert? So in your example um, of the uh, local control, mm -hmm. how is that decided? I mean, what, what happens there? I mean, I know, it's, I know it's a pretty big mess, but give an example where, where there's a medical authority, sort of mm -hmm. a, public, a local public health doc, or, and, and a few others. I mean, what, what happens in, in that situation? Well, the CDC had a program called Top Hat after the SARS epidemic, where they took a long, hard look at, at, at what some jurisdictions could do. And they actually did work communication, working with the courts, with the police, with the public health officials to, one, to decide who does, but also to make sure everybody knew who makes that decision. The public health officer generally makes the decision, but the court can overturn that decision. And the court is, you know, and, and the last thing you want is a Sessions judge who's handling criminal cases all of a sudden has, well, here comes this Ebola case and not have any idea of what his authority is, where he's going, what kind of hearing he wants. And this top hat uh, exercise, a big, a big exercise, looking at it, they pointed out the communication between the judges and the prosecutors and the police and the emergency medical people, along with the public health officials, was, um, was paramount. So as a practical matter, when it occurs, chances are the most, um, in the ideal situation, there's going to be the public health official who calls the shot because they'll be on the scene calling the shot. So um, which public health official? Depends on what the state says. Okay. So, so it's, it's a different person in each state. And it's also, there's a county public health official, there's a state public health official. Right. So even within the state, you have lots of potential for issues of who's calling the shots. Actually, have a county, a regional, and a state. Mm -hmm. And within each one, a medical director. Right. So we have six different people. Right, I guess at the regional level, a medical director, and then at the state, a medical director. Mm -hmm. So, so at, at, in a practical sense, with Hickok, the nurse from West Africa, did the state of New Jersey have a legal right to quarantine her? Well, not knowing the state laws, yes, they have the right to quarantine her. So 
and until the court says you don't. So what they would say is they would go in and make whatever argument they made before the court. The court would say, you haven't proven to us that she has a significant risk of um, spelling it. Larry Gostin, who uh, is a public health lawyer at Georgetown University, has an article in this week's New York Times where he takes her to task to say, you know, she did have some responsibility here. And, um, you know, not to, the, not to the New Jersey kind of quarantine, but the kind of quarantine that she uh, allegedly had agreed to. That, and, and, yeah, the whole monitoring. But, you know, the governor can, can make his decision, and the courts are going to be reluctant to overturn the governor's decision. Um, you know, I mean, there would certainly be a restraining order that would go into place, keeping her there until they made the decision, and then they would have to take a look at the evidence, take a look at, now this will be a judge who's, who could have been a tax attorney before he was a judge, who's got to look at this whole situation and say, what's the risk here? And, and his, his decision goes. And, and we can appeal it, and then we can appeal it to uh, the nine people who wear the black robes, and none of them are doctors either. And they're going to make the decision. Worse than that, some of them are lawyers. Some of them are lawyers. <laughs> some of them are lawyers, yep. That's it. And, and, and they make the decision. It's and, and all this has a time overlay to it. Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, you're talking about things that are pretty infectious here. Probably. Right. And, and the potential for abuse, we have that, that director telling the child that she can't go to school even because she was on the same continent as um, the thing, and, and, and coming out clear saying, and the reason you can't do this is because of panic, is because people don't like people like you who, uh, you know, who may have uh, been exposed to this disease. So it's a, it's a, it's a major concern. And um, you know, in a way, we're lucky to have the Ebola situation come to give us an idea of, a very good idea, of what kind of potential there is for problems in quarantine. If it should occur again, or if, uh, if God forbid, SARS, or some other uh, respiratory kind of virus should appear, uh, it would be quick. Um, I wasn't aware, even though my grandfather passed away during it, I, wasn't, I was not aware that, that, that the 50 million, the 50 million is conservative because it was a worldwide pandemic and it could have been up to 100 million people. So World War I was nothing compared to the flu epidemic. And, you know, and, and, and it moves quickly. The, the um, you know, the ability to, to react is, is one, you know, Ebola gives you the 21 days or whatever it gives you. The flu really doesn't. I've read the state of Tennessee statute and the implementing regulations, and, um, and they're modern. They follow, they aren't, aren't exactly the model emergency health act, the, the one that, that, that's, that, that's pushed, but they come pretty close to following the model emergency health act. Now the criticism of the model emergency health act was it takes away civil liberties, it's um, you know, jackboots and putting people away. Um, I think people are gonna look at it a little differently now as, as what kind of powers are in it. And I think we'll see significant changes. Not so much in Tennessee. Tennessee's law is pretty, pretty close to the Model Health Emergency Act. In fact, I think the next speaker is gonna specifically talk about that in the local uh, aspects. Uh, anything else? Yes? Was the Tennessee law recently amended in the last 10 years when I uh, first arrived 12 years ago? I looked it up and it explicitly mentioned uh, several diseases, and I was uh, dumbfounded that anyone would think about quarantining people with yellow fever since it's mosquito borne. Mm -hmm. That was there in the state statute. Has that been fixed? Uh, I know it's not. That's definitely not in the statute. I don't know if it's in the. I don't know if it's in the regulations or not. Most quarantines, are, you know, especially at the time of the revolution, many of the quarantines involved yellow fever and, and yellow fever and um, and plague. And uh, tuberculosis was another big one for quarantines as well. It's not an executive order either, I don't think. Well, the mode of transmission was figured out in the early 20th century, so I'm figuring it was mm -hmm. uh, a holdover from uh, the 19th century out of the statute. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, some of the worst civil rights tragedies that we've had in, in this country have involved um, using quarantine in a political sense. In Korematsu versus the United States, the Supreme Court 
authorized the quarantining of Japanese Americans through the entirety of World War II. So we had, um, you know, we had the quarantine used as a, as a political uh, element. And there are those who will say the quarantine tends to be used, at least has been in the past, used politically. The, the quarantining of prostitutes, the quarantining of Chinese immigrants, the, the, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a whole legacy of quarantine that, that actually could have been misused, or people will argue was, was misused. Anything else? Okay, if not, well, thank you very much. Add for the camera, we'll have the, the second lecture will be on Thursday at the same time, same uh, live streaming link. David Kursky, the medical director for the Northeast Region of the Tennessee Department of Health, speaking on Ebola implications for public health. Thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone. Okay, I bounced that around a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Josh.